Gut. Mikrofon. Ach, dann nehme ich das. Noch besser. Oh ja, ein großer Unterschied. Ja, mein Name ist Miriam Staute. Ich bin die neue Agrarministerin in Niedersachsen seit knapp äh, drei Monaten und ich freue mich sehr, Sie und euch hier heute in der niedersächsischen Landesvertretung begrüßen zu dürfen. Ich begrüße auch all diejenigen, die an den Endgeräten zu Hause die Veranstaltung verfolgen und vielleicht auch nachher noch mitdiskutieren wollen. Liebe Sarah, lieber Martin, ganz herzlichen Dank dafür, dass ihr die Landesvertretung als Veranstaltungsort gewählt habt. Wir wollen äh, als niedersächsische Landesregierung äh, tatsächlich auch, dass dieses Haus genutzt wird als ein Forum für den intensiven Austausch, wo auch unterschiedliche Positionen zur Diskussion gestellt werden können und wo wir eben auch Verständigungsprozesse anregen wollen. Es kommen noch weiter Gäste. Ich freue mich sehr. Ja, ich bin äh, heute und morgen noch hier sozusagen zum Antrittsbesuch als Agrarministerin ähm, aus Niedersachsen. Und Sie können sich vorstellen, dass ich eine ganze Reihe an Themen und Terminen jetzt habe, die Tage, ähm, und wir den Austausch suchen. Ich habe mich sehr gefreut, äh, dass das Thema Saatgut hier heute eine große Rolle spielen wird und kann leider tatsächlich aufgrund des Terminplans jetzt tatsächlich nur zur Begrüßung da sein. Aber meine Mitarbeiterinnen und Mitarbeiter und ich werden uns auf jeden Fall die Studie noch mal genau ansehen und auch die Diskussion nachverfolgen. Ja, wir haben in unserem Koalitionsvertrag in Niedersachsen ähm, mit unserem Koalitionspartner der SPD auch einige Punkte zum Thema Saatgut aufgenommen. Also wir haben ganz klar gesagt, wir wollen den Erhalt von vom Aussterben bedrohten Tier, aber auch Pflanzenarten ähm, unterstützen. Wir wollen On-Farm-Züchtung von samenfesten, nachbaufähigen Sorten fördern. Auch das Führen von Saatgutdatenbanken hat den Eingang in den Koalitionsvertrag gefunden und auch ein ganz klares Bekenntnis für Gentechnikfreiheit. Ähm, nun ist es ja so, dass äh, auch ein neuer Vorschlag der Kommission ins Haus steht zum Thema äh, Saatgut. Und wir gehen jetzt nicht unbedingt davon aus, dass als erstes im niedersächsischen Koalitionsvertrag nachgeschlagen werden wird, was denn äh, da eigentlich so verankert ist. Insofern bin ich sehr froh, dass wir hier heute mit der Vorstellung eurer Studie und der Diskussion mit den Teilnehmenden einen ersten großen Aufschlag, finde ich, haben für eine breite öffentliche Diskussion. Ich nehme das so wahr, dass wir tatsächlich in einer sehr interessierten, sehr engagierten Community schon seit vielen Jahren eine Diskussion zum Thema Schutz von Saatgut haben, dass es aber noch nicht gelungen ist, diese Diskussion ja für eine ganz breite Öffentlichkeit ähm, ähm, zu öffnen. Und ich erhoffe wirklich, dass äh, ihr mit eurer Studie da eine gute Grundlage ähm, auch noch mal legt. Es gab ja schon mal Gutachten oder Studien äh, von euch finanziert zum Thema ähm, Marktkonzentration im Bereich der Saatguthersteller. Das war auch, finde ich, ein sehr gutes Werk und Fundament für viele Diskussionen. Und wenn es jetzt eben neue Vermarktungsregelungen geht, ist es, glaube ich, auch sehr wichtig, sich sehr detailliert mit den verschiedenen Fragestellungen auseinanderzusetzen. Wir diskutieren, wenn es um die Zukunft des Ackerbaus der Landwirtschaft geht, immer viel um den Zugang zu Boden, viel um den Zugang zu Wasser jetzt in Zeiten des Klimawandels, aber eben relativ wenig über die Ressource Saatgut und das wird eigentlich der großen ähm, ähm, Bedeutung, die eben Saatgut für unsere tägliche Ernährung hat, äh, so nicht ähm, gerecht. Äh, ich glaube auch, dass das ganze Thema Klimakrise, Risikostreuung, die wir ja ähm, in vielen Bereichen befürworten, ähm, eng verbunden ist auch mit dem Thema Artenvielfalt. Und ich freue mich sehr auf das, was ihr, glaube ich, auch an konkreten Vorschlägen habt, wie Politik äh, reagieren soll. Ich glaube, es darf in Zukunft in vielen Bereichen eben nicht mehr nur um die Frage Hochleistung gehen, sondern vor allem um die Frage Resilienz von Systemen, ähm, aber wirklich runterdekliniert eigentlich in ähm, alle Bereiche. Also wir werden uns intensiv auch als Haus mit diesen Fragen beschäftigen in der nächsten, in der nächsten Zeit. Wir werden ganz sicherlich auch äh, den Dialog mit den verschiedensten Playern ähm, im Bereich der Saatgutherstellung 
ähm, führen. Da gibt es ja auch in Niedersachsen einige und ich bin auch schon an verschiedenen Stellen auf die Veranstaltung heute angesprochen worden, was denn da wohl diskutiert werden wird. Ich äh, wünsche allen einen guten Austausch, ähm, eine lebhafte Debatte, viele Informationen und übergebe jetzt das Wort an, ich glaube, ich ziehe an Sarah. Genau, prima. Vielen Dank. Erst einmal vielen lieben Dank, liebe Miriam Staude. Aber ich wollte mich auch bedanken hier für die ganzen Mitarbeiter, die diese Veranstaltung überhaupt ermöglicht haben. Hier im Haus, aber auch im Europäischen Parlament, vom Büro Martin Häusling und von meinem eigenen Büro natürlich. Ah, da sehe ich auch einen ehemaligen Mitarbeiter, der jetzt in einer anderen Vertretung arbeitet. Ja, ich freue mich, dass Sie so zahlreich erschienen sind. Ich äh, wollte nur kurze Einführungsworte reden und ich wollte es nicht allzu politisch machen, obwohl Sie mir schon gestatten, dass ich das eine oder andere Wort zu der jetzigen Situation sage, zu unserem Saatgut, das ja ungefähr 13.000 Jahre her ist, wo dann überhaupt Wildkräuter angebaut worden sind. Also die Basis unseres Weltenerbe, das sich regional evolutionär mit dem Klima, mit dem Wetter so entwickelt hat zu einer Vielfalt, die wir jetzt gerade in den letzten 50 Jahren bis zu 95 Prozent wieder verloren haben. Und äh, um ein Beispiel zu sagen, was ich damit meine, ähm, als Köchin, was das für ein Verlust ist, nicht, ich rede nicht von der Biodiversität für die äh, Mikroorganismen im Boden, für die komplexen Ökosysteme, sondern einfach auch für uns und für unseren Teller. Wissen Sie, was das beliebteste Gemüse der Deutschen ist? Na, die Tomate. Die Tomate. Äh, wissen Sie ungefähr, was schätzen Sie, wie viele Sorten an Tomaten gibt es weltweit? Das ist eine grobe Schätzung, weil natürlich gibt es immens viele, die nicht registriert sind. Achenoa darf sich jetzt nicht beteiligen an diesem Quiz. Was schätzen Sie? Einfach eine Zahl. 1000. 500. Ja, also der Herr da vorne liegt schon ziemlich nah. Also es sind mehrere tausend. Man schätzt mindestens 20.000. 20.000 verschiedene Tomatensorten. Um, und wenn Sie jetzt Ihrem Kind sagen, zeichne mal mit Tomate auf. Wie würde das ausschauen? Rot und rund. So, jetzt muss man wissen, dass die Vielfalt der Tomatensorte ja nicht eine rote, runde, oft, wenn sie aus den Getreidehäusern kommen, eine geschmacksfeste Wasserstruktur hat, sondern dass Tomaten in ihrer Vielfalt von gelb, orange, violett, schwarz, gepunktet, gestreift, äh, zusammengewachsen, wie Raupen ausschauen, drei Kilo wiegen können oder so groß wie eine kleine Riebisel sein können und auch unterschiedliche Geschmäcker haben. Diese Vielfalt, diese Geschmacksvielfalt können Sie ja aber natürlich nur nachfragen, wenn Sie einen Namen dafür haben, wenn Sie eine Sorte haben. Sie können ja nicht einfach in den Supermarkt sehen und sagen, ah, letzte Woche hatte ich so da so eine orange-rote Tomate, äh, hätte ich heute gern wieder. Da ist es sehr wahrscheinlich, dass äh, Ihnen nicht weitergeholfen werden kann, weder in diesem Supermarkt noch auf einem anderen Platz, weil Sie keinen nicht mal mehr einen Namen haben für diese Sorten. Jetzt frage ich Sie, Sie sind ja alle gebildet, politisch interessiert, sonst würden Sie heute nicht hier sitzen. Wie viele Tomatensorten kennen Sie denn persönlich? Also für jemand, der mehr, sagen wir mal, als sechs Sorten kennt, kriegt einen Preis von mir, ein Kochbuch. Oh, ja? Wissen Sie? Achso, nein? Ich dachte... Varieties of Tomato. Marzano, okay. Yes, okay, okay. I, I let it. Ja, yeah, Ochsenherz. Chilicino, I don't know. Okay, okay. Three, okay, okay. Roma. Roma, Tomate, gut. Okay, yes, okay, I let it count. Ja. Yeah. And I help you. When 
not to Napoli. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, Kovara, you don't, you have to know. In the <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, also applause, immerhin, uh, würde ich sagen, you will have a cookbook from me. Uh, in, in Germany, but she will write your address and she will give it to what What profession have you? Uh, I work for Fibo Europe uh, and okay. manage for the Okay. Habt ihr verstanden? Er ist vom Fibel und macht ein Projekt über Samen. Gut, das ist ein guter Anfang. Gratulation. Was ich sagen wollte ist, wir können nicht einmal mehr eine Sehnsucht nach dem Richtigen entwickeln. Und die Sehnsucht nach dem Richtigen verteidigen, wenn es sie nicht mehr existiert und wenn wir sie nicht mehr schützen können und wenn wir sie nicht mehr einfordern können. Sie sind ja manche, manche sind so alt wie ich, ein bisschen jünger. In meiner Zeit können Sie sich erinnern, dass es Radieschen gab, die waren so scharf, dass sie zum Weinen angefangen haben. Erinnern Sie sich daran, dass Sie wunderbare, knackige, saftige Radieschen reingebissen haben und da war so viele Senföle dran, dass man irgendwie das nur mit dem Butterbrot essen konnte, weil es wirklich so stark war. Was ist uns an Vielfalt und an Schönheit, an regionalen Sorten verloren gegangen bis hierhin? Und es hört nicht auf. Und warum? Weil heute wir eine Situation haben, dass vier ganze Großkonzerne den Großteil unserer Saat gut dominiert. Wer sind diese vier Konzerne? Und das ist das Absurde. Das sind Chemiekonzerne. Das sind nicht einmal Bauerngenossenschaft, die sich entwickelt hat. Es sind Chemiekonzerne. Es ist Bayer, BASF, Corteva und Syngenta. Und ausgerechnet diese vier Monopolisten von Saatgut, die auch die unsere Gene manipulieren, also äh, patentieren, ausgerechnet die haben auch noch das Monopol über 70 Prozent unseres Pestizide weltweit. Das heißt, es passt ja als Chemiekonzert, diese Konzerne haben nicht unseren Geschmack, unsere Gesundheit, unsere Vielfalt, unsere Lust auf dem Zettel, sondern nur einzig und allein eine gewinnbringende Retro Reproduzierbarkeit, also Gewinnspanne, um sozusagen mehr Geld zu machen. Auf Kosten unseres Tellers, auf Kosten unseres Geschmacks und auf Kosten auch auf unseren eigenen Mikrobioms, aber das ist ein anderer Vortrag. Ich möchte es hiermit belassen, Sie werden jetzt gleich viele, viele andere Themen hören und auch etwas Politisches. Ich glaube, es ist an der Zeit, dass wir unser Weltenerbe verteidigen, dass wir die Fahne hochhalten für eine Vielfalt, die nämlich genau diese Vielfalt in uns in multiplen Krisen resilient gegen die Krisen machen wird. Nur eine Vielzahl von Netzwerken wird uns eine Sicherheit geben, um auch einen Morgen glücklich und überlebensfähig zu machen. Wir sollten unsere Eier nicht in einem Korb leben, aber auch nicht alle Tomaten oder alle Samen, sondern wir sollten die Vielfalt aufteilen, da wir wirklich in der Zukunft gewappnet sind, um über diese Krisen zu kommen, die wir äh, jetzt ja, mit, äh, mit denen wir konfrontiert sein werden. Und dann gestatten Sie mir noch einen Satz, weil ich höre das jetzt jeden Tag im Parlament von bestimmten Fraktionen. Wir haben keine Ernährungskrise im Sinne von Ernährungsunsicherheit. Ich möchte das hier nochmal betonen, weil äh, dieser Spruch, wir, wir würden jetzt alle morgen verhungern oder wir hätten eine äh, Ernährungsunsicherheit, verhindern sehr viele wichtige Teile von der Farm to Fork und vom Green Deal und zum Beispiel eine, eine wirklich eine Pestizidreduktion, äh, wo weltweit führende Wissenschaftler einfordern, dass wir diese brauchen. Auch da unterhalte ich mich gern mit Ihnen, wenn Sie dazu etwas wissen möchten, privat. So, jetzt gebe ich aber weiter an Dorothee André die Ihnen äh, von der, als Head of Unit Plant Health von der EU-Kommission hoffentlich Erleuchtendes sagen möchte, denn die Kommission möchte ja Anfang Juni äh, ihren neuen Plan oder ihren neuen Entwurf vorstellen und ich hoffe, dass wir uns sehr darüber freuen werden können. Bitte. So, thank you, thank you very much for inviting us here to participate to this event. Thank you um, also for your political study. 
done by or commissioned by Sahavina and Martin Häusling. We read the study with great interest and I think it provides an interesting historical background on plant breeding and the efforts uh, plant breeding tries to make. Uh, also the attempts of the, the past attempt to revise the legislation, which was not a success story. And also <laughs> the ideas how to revise uh, the, the, the existing legislation now. And, and thank you also for the recommendation for the future. Um, they come, they come, they arrive on time because we are working on it, we are drafting. So thanks a lot for the recommendation. So let me say that the legislation date back from the 60s and they were put in place for two main objectives. One is product, productivity and second is quality of seeds. So we believe that the quality of seeds and the productivity are still objective, which are valid for today, but with other objectives which add to it. So um, with uh, the variety registration and certification as was put in place by the legislation, we have seen some side effects. And uh, your document uh, describes them. So, for example, conservation varieties, it is said that um, with the legislation, nevertheless, the market of these varieties has been restricted or is not as it should, could be. So that's a, a fact. Um, but we know that such varieties are very important for low input and organic production and that they also provide genetic material for further breeding effort, efforts. So this was one way this conservation variety was solved. We have also tried to solve, but not sufficiently, um, the, the way uh, to regulate organic varieties or organic heterogeneous material. And uh, on this, however, we, we see that uh, for organic varieties, we have these limitations uh, due to this distinctness, uniformity and stability examination. And we have tried to put some different rules for organic varieties, but there still work to be done. Heterogeneous material, we worked on it, but it's heterogeneous material for organic production only. So, there are some positive steps, but not sufficient steps. So this has to be improved clearly. And uh, I think we are more than conscious of this. So now this revision uh, comes also at a time where I think everybody is convinced of the climate change, of the environmental degradation, and that we must pre preserve our environment and adapt and have things which are resilient. Obviously, seed is the beginning of the chain and the beginning should be resilient. So that's why these seeds are part of this global uh, policy to have healthy people, healthy societies and a healthy planet with a sustainable food system. And this is part of the European Green Deal. And as you know, one part of it is the farm to fork. And in this farm to fork comes also the recognition that the system should be ensuring seed security and diversity. And in the farm to fork, we also cited that we would, we should ensure that farmers have access to a wide range of quality of seeds and plant varieties adapted to the climate change pressure and that we should facilitate the registration of these varieties and organic farming and ensure easier market access to traditional and locally adapted varieties. That, so that's part of the farm to fork. So what are we trying to do now with this uh, upcoming proposal? One is simplify and modernize the legislation, improve coherence with 
legislation which was uh, adopted, official control or regulation, plant health legislation, which should enable also innovation. So by this we mean um, digitalize what can be digitalized, live in a modern world, and also use techniques. I don't speak about new genomic techniques. <laughs> Careful, <laughs> I'm speaking about biomolecular techniques, marker genes, so nothing to do with the NGT or GMO, or whatever. Uh, so that we can use this also in the breeding process, helping the breeding process. So we want material which is suitable for future challenges. We also aim to facilitate the registration of the organic varieties, suitable for organic production. We have the target, 25%, obviously. We have also to give the means to reach the target with the, the varieties which go with it. So that's certainly one important element. And we want to support the conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources. So for this audience, you're more interested in some elements of the proposal. So I will concentrate on those. Uh, which are also part of your recommendations. So for conservation variety, the idea is to lift most of these restrictions, well, this quantitative restriction, these uh, geographic restrictions, and uh, so to facilitate the access, and expand the scope, not only to the past, the conservation of the past, but to extend it to newly bred locally adapted varieties. So to make the bridge between the past and the future for this type of varieties. For organic varieties, we have some specific legislation on a few species for the different testing with less uniformity. And we want to widen this uh, in the revision of the legislation. Heterogeneous material for the moment, it's organic only organic heterogeneous material. And our intention is to widen the scope beyond organic production for all. There should be heterogeneous material, not just for organic farming, but for everybody. Why only for organic? Obviously, the organic will be happy, but the other ones may also want to have it. So why not? So yes, for sure, it will be included. And uh, another element which you have uh, commented upon is the exchange in kind uh, between farmers. And on this one, we are thinking of uh, putting conditions to this exchange in kind to allow it under light conditions or light conditions, but to avoid that it is misused fully. So uh, we, we are thinking of a, a drafting which could be uh, a good idea and uh, so that's the way we are going for it so in the options there were fully exclusion fully inclusion or something in between with light so we are going in, in, more or less in this direction so thank you very much for all your recommendations i said that we read them attentively for sure we will reread them we will also listen to the discussion today because it will help, help us to understand them fully. And uh, we, as I said, are drafting. But we have also this internal rule, which is uh, for a, a, any uh, commission proposal, we have to go to this scrutiny board with the impact of the proposal. So we are aiming here for 15 of February. Hopefully, our analysis will be accepted and hopefully we can proceed. Maybe we'll get some comments here and there, but well, this can be improved. And then the objective is to adopt it by the Commission on 7th of June. So I think, yes, we agree fully with you that it is time to revise this market seed marketing legislation and 
we will really fully integrate all the aspects on diversity, diversity heterogeneity, resilience, and also sustainability. And um, so this will be part of our revision. 7th of June adoption, and then goes the co-legislative process, starts, and we hope that we will have good discussions. And uh, we hope also we are coming early enough in the process and uh, that uh, everybody will have time and to, to, to look at it carefully. I think it's very important. The legislation is outdated. Uh, we try to make it fit for the current world and the current objectives. And uh, the world has changed, the objectives have changed, and we have to make it fit for the purpose now. So there will be changes, quite some important changes. There will also be things which are kept because they worked. And um, we hope that we will have good discussion in the Council and in the Parliament, and that we can revise this. Obviously, there will be some improvements. It's also always better when other people look at it. Something better will come out after the end of the process. More brains, more ideas, and uh, we, are, we are always happy to have discussion. But I think we have been thinking quite a lot internally and uh, with the other colleagues, the other DGs, the other services. And collectively, we should come out with something which is an important step into the right direction of the farm to fork strategy and i hope that it will receive good success and uh, so we are looking forward to be soon with you <laughs> and uh, we have also been listening to the stakeholders uh, quite a lot our contractor did a lot of studies we heard we went to the parliament also to different events and uh, we have been listening to the member states so i think we listened and we will see if we listened well and we will improve it afterwards or you will improve it afterwards so that's uh, what we wanted to say here and i'm looking forward for the discussion and thanks again for the invitation um thank you Thank you very much, uh, Mr. André. But now, as moderator of this session, I have to tell you we have one hour, 25 minutes, and we will try to do our best to use that time. Where is my next speaker? Uh, just before we start to summarize what the study is about, just a little... Um, reply to you, Ms. André. That sounded all great. And I have the feeling every 10 years the Commission can come up with something that has a good chance to pass. What I heard a lot is that you said there are the good elements in the organic regulation and why not open that further into, let's call it conventional farming practices, where in my view, most of the problems lie at the moment to adapt that system or to reform that system in a way that really responds to the challenges of climate change and so on. Heterogeneous material you mentioned is one part of it. And the question is, how far will the Commission really go to question whether that system is the rule and the organic system is the exception? because it sounded a little bit, there's a door open now from the organic regulation to the general regulation on marketing of seeds. So that will be interesting in the debate where the, where the result can be in, in opening. It sounded a little bit like liberalization of the seed market. That would be an interesting path to discuss whether that's the case. Because Saravina said right before, the concentration in the seed sector is, is demanding a certain system. And we are now sitting somewhere in between. But that was just my remark as a first reaction. And now I hand over to Katrin to present the study. Thank you very much. 
I'm Catherine Dolan. I'm from Achinoa. We were kindly uh, requested to write a study on the upcoming reform of the seed marketing rules by Martin Huisling and Sarah Wiener. We're very grateful that we had the opportunity to write the study and to present it here today. As we've heard, the proposal will be published on the 7th of June along as part of a wider package and in the public debate there has been more focus on the GMO issue, for example. And it's good to also now have the opportunity to put the spotlight on the seed marketing laws because we've heard they've been around for a long time. We now have the chance to redefine those rules for the coming generations. That's really important because those rules set the framework for the conservation of plant genetic diversity. And they can also, as we've also heard, it's been touched on, facilitate the transition to truly sustainable agriculture. So it's, it's an important issue and yeah, it's good that it's we're having this opportunity today to talk about it. So the study is available outside. I'm gonna do a rapid run through because uh, I've been requested to keep it brief. We've also heard some new information from the commission about their thinking. So I will pick and select some slides. Also, just to say it was meant to be my colleague Magdalena Prela who wrote the study, unfortunately fell in yesterday. So I have taken over from yesterday. I apologize if in some place it's a bit rough and ready. Um, but firstly, in case you don't know Achenoa, we are a seed saver organization based in Austria, just outside of Vienna. We have one of the largest private collections of plant genetic diversity in Europe, with around 5,005 different uh, varieties in our seed archive. And we are active with our members for political change at national and European level to promote the conservation and development of plant genetic diversity. It's already been touched on, there has been a significant loss in plant genetic diversity over the past decades. We feel it in our plates, we feel it in our gardens, we see it in the fields. Um, plants or seeds are a really highly regulated resource. So we're talking today about seed marketing, the rules on production and marketing of seeds. But just to complete the picture, there are other rules affecting seeds, the use, the transfer, the development as well. There's rules on plant health operators have to make sure that plants and seeds are free of pests and diseases those rules will exist regardless of what regulated under the marketing rules or not it's often a misunderstanding oh but if we deregulate something if we liberalize something it will lead to the spread of risks those rules will apply to the movement of plant and seeds regardless of what happens in this case another really significant issue it's out of the scope of this discussion today is intellectual property rights plant variety protection, but also the increasing patenting of plant traits of genetic information, which are blocking the access to genetic diversity for breeders and farmers to develop new varieties. There's a, perhaps a discussion for another day. In response to these developments, to growing corporate control, to growing um, homogenization, there has been the rise of seed activism. A really key uh, development was 2018, the in, UN Declaration on the Residence of Pe Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas, which established a human right to seeds, which is something that we expect and hope to be incorporated into the new, the new rules that the, yeah, the right of peasants to, to grow, pass on, sell, exchange seeds is guaranteed in the new proposals. Um, one last thing to bear in mind is that when we talk about seeds, seeds and seeds actors come in all different shapes and sizes. We have the uniform plant varieties, the modern varieties that dominate the market. But we also have more di genetically diverse land races and farmer populations. We have crop wild relatives, which include important trait for plant breeders, for farmers, for example, disease resistance or drought tolerance. And yeah, the different the actors that both use genetic diversity and produce it are very varied and it's important that the, it's a big challenge for the regulation for the legislation to incorporate all the different needs and interests of those actors so it's no small task i'll just skip through this we've heard about the reform we've heard about the history uh yeah commission has also said it's it's outdated just to maybe note that the the principles that I'm going to quickly outline of the seed marketing regulation date back around 100 years. They were introduced in some European states before the European level rules were introduced in the 1960s. And as was mentioned, they were there to improve quality and transparency in a, in a completely different world. And 
The market is different now, access to information, ex information exchange between farmers is different. And yeah, we've seen that the focus on short term productivity is having negative impacts for our, for our diets, for our climate, for our soil. So a complete rethink is really necessary. So quick crash course for those of you who don't know in seed marketing legislation, it's a real belt and braces approach. So from my perspective, our perspective, where the legislator can regulate, it has regulated. So it has the principle of pre-market registration. If I want to market a variety, I have to get the, the authority to approve it. They do tests. These tests can take between one and five years. They check, is the variety very genetically uniform? Are all the plants very, have a very, very, very similar? Is it stable over years? for cereals as an additional test on value and cultivation. So it's a slow process, it's a costly process, it's a very high barrier to entry. Beyond that, there's also rules on seed production. So it's not just about the variety has to meet standards, but then the specific lots of seeds have to meet standards. There's seed lot certification, the authorities come and do field inspections. And then there's the rules on labeling and packaging, what has to be on there. So at all levels of the process, there are very strict rules. Go looking forward, I think it's actually widely acknowledged now, it's mainstream, we need diversity. So Ravina explained very well why diversity has to be at the centre of the reform, enabling more plant genetic diversity to be on the market. So the overall goals of the, of the reform must be to enable and safeguard effective conservation of plant genetic diversity. Plant genetic diversity, that means traits that we'll need in the future to develop varieties to have plant material that will grow in the future. We also need to facilitate the transformation of sustainable agriculture to sustainable agriculture. So do we have seeds that grow well under low input or organic conditions? Do we have species that make a plant based diet more attractive? Do we have seeds that farmers can plant again each year? Or are they forced to to repurchase each year? Those things and there's obviously a lot of factors that affect the agricultural system, but it does really begin with the seed. So the Commission in 2021 presented various options. We've heard today some updates. There are four key issues, I'll go back, from our perspective, that affect diversity. We've got the scope, the provisions on conservation, the provisions on variety registration and sustainability, and the governance. The definition of seed marketing, this is really, really a key issue. So at the, currently, the rules apply to sales aimed at commercial exploitation of seeds to third parties. This has been interpreted very differently in the member states, some very lenient, some much more strict, for example, in Poland, where every exchange of seed is covered as marketing. Our recommendation is that the scope should be limited to commercial activities targeting professional units. What does this mean? It means sales to amateur gardeners aren't covered by variety registration. We don't need a standard that was created for industrial agriculture that's very burdensome and costly to apply when seeds are being sold to hobby gardeners. At Arkino, we have hundreds of tomato varieties in our uh, collection. To go back to the tomato example, we market, I think, five or six because it's too difficult. Why can't gardeners have hundreds of tomato varieties from us? Next, all activities aimed at conservation and adaptation to local conditions should not be regulated. Farmer and seed exchange in kind offer money com monetary compensation. Here, it's from our perspective important, it's just not, it's not just about enabling seed swaps, exchange in kind. We also need to enable exchange for monetary compensation because the cost associated with seed production is very different for different species. It's not always a like for like exchange. You have limitations with germination. There are, there are quite big restraints if you limit exchange in kind. So there should also be exchange for monetary compensation. It's something that the Austrian government has already implemented. Uh, we don't see any, any problems or evidence of detriment. I might skip that one. Moving on to conservation. At the currently, there is no formal exemption for conservation work. It's again, dependent on the definition of marketing by the member states. What's really critical in the future is that all activities aiming at conservation or adaptation is out of scope. We don't want to put more burdens on conservation of plant genetic diversity where we've already lost so, feel, so much. 
and it's important that it's not limited to formal structures to associations. The actors involved in conservation are very diverse from individuals to formal associations. You don't want to limit it to certain structures. Next on to sustainable use. So as I think, you, think you'll know, conservation can't be limited to gene banks. It has to also be on the field, effective conservation through sustainable use. We currently have these derogatory regimes that were mentioned, um, conservation varieties, amateur varieties, and more recently, organic heterogeneous material. These are niches in the regulation where it is easier to get your variety to market. The testing by the, the standards applied by the national authorities for the registration of a variety are not so strict. Again, it's very different between the different member states. In Austria, it's relatively easy to register an amateur variety. But in Poland, there are none. The authority does not provide an enabling environment for amateur varieties to be registered. We propose that we get rid of those concepts and in, pro, pro, in produce a new umbrella term of diversity cultivar. So everything as a key, so the key, key feature here is that this idea of DUS testing uh, there, is the variety very highly genetically uniform and stable that we get rid of it? That's a concept that stems from plant variety protection to enable the granting of plant variety protection of intellectual property rights. It doesn't really have a role. It shouldn't have a role in determining what can enter the market in the first place. So we want to remove that concept for these diversity cultivars, simplify the regime because these existing niches are complicated. They've been implemented differently in the member states have a, a fresh, fresh start, diversity cultivars. You can notify them based on a description of the material. It's a free procedure with no restrictions. Then another aspect that has been mentioned um, in the commission's documents is a new focus on sustainability in, for example, variety testing. We haven't heard really what that more detail on what that could look like. But it's very important that we take a sustainable, a holistic approach to sustainability. It's not about single traits. It's about the, the, the plant variety as a whole. And another issue that hasn't been touched on, but it's very important from our perspective is about greater transparency. So currently seed labels are regulated. There's a list of things that have to be put on the seed label. Some of them are actually completely meaningless to the end consumer, but things like what was the breeding technique? Are there intellectual property rights on the variety that restrict how I can use it? What conditions does it grow on well? That's not necessarily on the label. So that transparency we think should be included for modern seed marketing legislation. Finally, on governance, uh, I think I'll leave the points on official controls. It's maybe a bit too much detail for today, but the key point is uh, that there needs to be inclusion of the diverse range of actors in all governance and decision making processes. Um, we've been, yeah, we've welcomed the long consultation process that the Commission has conducted. We note that for small initiatives, it can be very difficult to sometimes engage in those for resource reasons. Um, we hope that the way the proposal is then published and presented as a legal text is accessible to, to organisations with fewer lawyers. So just to maybe have, if I've got one minute left to run through the final, the, summarise the conclusions again. We want a limited, we recommend a legislation with limited scope, only regulating large scale commercial activities profession, for professionals, no regulation of sales to hobby gardeners, conservation efforts, farmer seed systems. With a new approach to a variety registration for so-called diversity cultivars, where a simplified procedure moving away from the standards that are applied to industrial crops. A holistic approach to sustainability if in the evaluation of varieties. Transparent labeling. And democratic government mechanisms. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Catherine, uh, for being so quick and running through this. No, no, no. I would like you to stay here. I, I will move here. And then uh, all the things you were not able to say, you can still say here. And here's, okay. here's, here's water for you. That's enough. Yes. You. Um, let me see how I can manage this now. Okay, so I would like to ask everybody who is who can identify her or his name to to join this very packed panel. But I hope you will find a seat. Whoops. And as we have just about an hour to continue, and I want to include a maximum of questions and people to intervene here, I would like to ask everybody, I will introduce you in a minute. And then I would like to have your comments on what has been said so far. So what the Commission promised and uh, what this study said and proposes. But of course you can extend it to things which haven't been said so that we get really into debate together. I can, sit you, I can see you are sitting pretty, pretty close together that hopefully we get to also some kind of good conclusions together. So first of all, welcome Mr. Spiridon Flivaris, your policy officer for health and food safety at the Directorate General Santé of the European Commission and your focus of work on the day-to-day -day implementation of the legislation on seed and plant propagating material. So are you really at the core of this new regulation? And I'm pretty sure that you've been chosen by Mrs. Andre to be the right one to answer questions and to give us all the details. My little kickoff um, for this debate is that it's not only this proposal that will be proposed in June. There are a few others which go with it. I won't mention them because you may want to mention them and to say how that may be linked to each other or whether there are any conditions of one regulation being linked to the other regulation. But I leave it to you to let us know what the package is about, because there's a lot of speculation about the package of different regulations in which one is the seed regulation. Over to you. You are the first one to comment. I think it's or orally. It should work. Otherwise, you get mine. Yes. Yes, it works. We can hear you. So uh, very close, closely uh, discussed in initiatives are on the new genomic techniques. So this is about the breeding, new uh, GMOs, or if you want to say a different category of GMO. Um, that proposal will uh, put rules on the authorization of such products and the relationship with the marketing, seed marketing legislation is once such products are authorized, they can be in new varieties, and then the varieties will be marketed according to the rules. So it's like today we have a GMO authorization. If a G GMO is authorized, then a variety can come to the market following the safety assessment. Uh, then a GMO variety today is subject to the marketing rules. So in a similar way, uh, whatever these rules are going to be for NGT authorization, uh, a variety with such traits will go through the marketing. The authorization is, that's how they separate between them. Um, there is a wider, there is a wider discussion, uh, a wider framework for food. A little bit further up, yeah. Further up. The interpreters. Okay. Right here. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But okay. the interpreters need to understand. Okay. Um, the framework for a food sustainable uh, system um, that is going to propose a bit later. Um, 
broader principles for the system sustainability. Now, we have heard discussions that it's a bit in the wrong order, but we are quite confident that uh, whatever we can address in the seed marketing legislation already for sustainability does not need to wait for a definition of uh, wider principles. All the things we can address in this legislation will be addressed and uh, knowing what is uh, general uh, sustainable food system, we know that it will be consistent. Okay. okay. These are the two main... Uh, Thank you very much. Eric Gall is Deputy Director of IFORM Organics Europe since some time. I think you joined um, IFORM as policy managers in 2014. So you kind of came into the discussion about this legislation about seed marketing at the right time. Um, um, your um, background is also you've been uh, at Greenpeace working on GMOs. And uh, so maybe that's the, that's the first comment you could give. What do you think about this packaging of, of proposals? What do you um, envisage or what do you um, expect from that package? Well, thank you for reminding me of my youth, uh, Anes. <laughs> Always very nice. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I, I think this packaging is a bit uh, uh, worrying, to be honest with you. Uh, because on the one hand, we clearly need a, a, a reform of the seed legislation, which, as you said, and as Dorote said, is clearly outdated, and that's why the Commission prepared this review. Uh, but on the other end, uh, we certainly not need a deregulation of GMOs and of new genetic engineering techniques uh, as well. I mean, you mentioned uh, that there is a legal framework for the identification of GMOs, that's true, and this should be maintained, you know, whether there is a new proposal for entities or not, it's very important that transparency, traceability, and this identification of new genetic engineering techniques remains. And we have heard indeed, you know, some stakeholders saying that we don't need a regulation for new genetic engineering techniques. This can be addressed through the seed legislation. I don't know how, uh, concretely speaking, this would work. Um, but clearly, we need uh, uh, to keep, you know, the biosafety legislation that we have for GMOs, also for the new genetic engineering techniques. So from this point of view, there should be no link between the two pieces of legislation. Uh, and if I may comment a bit on the, on the study that was prepared by our, our KNOA, um, we've had long discussions in the organic movement about our expectations for, for this reform of the seeds. I think, I think it's safe to say uh, that we all members, so organic farmers, organic breeders, um, and uh, processors as well, because they are so involved as well as retailers, you know, in developing uh, organic seed production and organic plant breeding. Uh, they, they, I think they do agree with most of what you presented, you know, I think as a rule, uh, the scope of the legislation should be as limited as possible. But I would very much caution uh, against this picture that on the one hand, you would have, you know, amateurs and gardeners that should be out of the scope of the legislation and that would take care of bringing back biodiversity and on the other end professional users for which the system would more or less remain the same. No, we do have farmers and primarily organic farmers who are who want to have biodiversity in their fields and they are professional users so it's very clear that also you know the part of a legislation that will remain regulated will need to be adapted to make room for, for diversity. And like it was mentioned, you know, there was progress already through the organic regulation with heterogeneous uh, material. Uh, we have a temporary experiment on organic varieties uh, as well, which is precisely aimed at assessing, you know, how these DUS criteria should be adapted to make room for diversity uh, in, uh, in plant breeding and, uh, and with varieties in the legal sense. And uh, this is a very important aspect as well that should not be forgotten uh, in this review. Yes, we need to liberate diversity for as many uh, people uh, as possible, that's very clear. But we have to make sure that also, you know, the, the current rules for registration and certification be adapted to make room for this diversity and to accommodate all the farmers, organic or not, who want to, to work with biodiversity in their fields. 
Thank you very much, Eric. Um, interesting. I, I feel organic producers are kind of in between, you know, on the one hand, yes, it's nice, the gardeners and heterogeneous material and all that's fine. We have to produce, we have to also be productive. And that's a little claim in there that you are now in the middle between the two and that into the conventional sector, you are claiming give us the right conditions so that we can gain a little bit more to become the rule. Is that right? And the conventionals could slowly move out of the picture if you if you consider sustainable farming has its heart at organic. I could kind of feel that. I would not I would not say organic producers are in the middle. I would rather say we have a bridge. We have a bridge between, you know, uh, biodiversity and the, and the people on the ground taking care of biodiversity, making it live, uh, and, and the farming community, uh, indeed, which has its own constraints. It's difficult being a farmer, whether, you, whether you're a conventional farmer or, a, or an organic farmer. But, you know, organic farming is a social movement as well. And many of these people who have entered organic farming, whether they were a conventional farmer before or whether they are you know, an engineer who wanted to change life and, uh, and participate to preventing the collapse of biodiversity. They want to do farming. They sell food products to people and to companies, but they want to work with nature and with biodiversity as well. So we, we are not in the middle unless uh, we, we see not yet. ourselves not as, yet. as the I bridge between yet. society bridging. and nature and, okay. uh, and the farming world. Yeah, and, and Catherine, of course, wants to react. Uh, she doesn't want to sit just uh, on the corner of the whole thing. <laughs> so it's your... Thank you. I just wanted to add, there was one point on sustainability in the report that I, I ran through a bit quickly uh, because the Commission had said it wants to incorporate sustainability in the registration of new varieties. So sustainability should be reflected. One of our recommendations would be that the testing of new varieties takes place under low input or organic conditions. It's often a, a problem we hear from organic breeders at the moment is they develop a, a variety under organic growing conditions and then it's tested under conventional conditions with pesticides and um, fertilizers and it doesn't it doesn't grow the same. Uh, we would like to we suggest to turn that around make the playing make the standard low input or organic and see how the varieties perform because that's the standard that we need in the future varieties should be tested and prove themselves under that standard interesting point thank you very much i would like to bring um, annika michelson in now um, she is a senior lecturer at hema university of applied sciences in finland where she coordinates the finnish heritage cereals propagation network uh, but you are today sharing with us your activities at the ngo matias uh, estonian seed saver organization and the network um, is including Estonia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Denmark. So in Nordic, is it? Is it? Yes, we correct? have cooperation with them, but this organization, Madias, it's only the Estonian seed saver. Okay, but I I, I uh, heard that uh, you are pretty present in the whole Nordic region in yeah. working with, uh, <laughs> no. with seed savers. So yeah. over to you. Correct me what I. There are so few persons up there in the north that we know all each other and cooperate. So sparsely populated area. Yes, yeah, sparsely populated area. I would like also to um, comment here on Eric's or continue perhaps a little bit on this that uh, we are reproducing. Yes, the gene bank materials now for the farmers in Finland because we have only uh, 100 growing days and uh, nothing that we can get from the other places in European Union will actually work in Finland. You know, only the most southern, southern areas, it, it will work if it works, but usually it doesn't work that well as the climate is changing now. So uh, we are totally left alone because also the Swedes, they are uh, cultivating south of Stockholm. So the Finnish agriculture start well, well, you have on the level of Stockholm and Helsinki, there begins the Finnish ag agriculture. So actually we cannot even take uh, traits from Sweden and use them in Finland. We have to select them always. Some areas in Norway we can use, but they are also pretty high up and there is not so much agriculture either. And the problem is that uh, when we are reproducing now these heritage cereals, so they give half of the yield. So economically, I cannot see why it would be benefiting for traditional farmers to start using them if they have an input of pesticides and mineral fertilizers, they will never get money out of it. So even if they are interested, then at least 
it would not function. I don't know, some suicide candidates now. I mean, putting out a lot and getting a very little yield in. Uh, that is the situation in Finland now. And, but uh, it's the ecological farmers who are doing these reproductions. <laughs> so they, are, they have interest and they can see that it gives an additional value to it. And the Baltic countries, they are also all around the Baltic Sea. We are in pretty same situation, all of us now, with this very 100 days of growing season. I understood that you also were successful in moving your government into the right direction with a good program on conservation and sustainable use yes. of genetic um, resources. Is there any recommendation for the commission that needs to be included still in their, in their regulation? Yes, I have heard that. There are like communication problems that in some countries in Europe, when you call your ministry workers, then they don't answer. Um, not the call and not answer the letters. We don't have this problem up in Estonia. I just called the ministry. I said, I want a meeting. And they say, OK, next week, this time. And uh, so we have actually, through communication, we have solved the problems. They are not um, brought. The, we are making first the, chain in the change in Estonia in the national law. Uh, it took a few years, but uh, it was just explaining what we would like and why we would like to have the change. And then we, uh, hopefully, we will have it then in the national legislation. Then they will open up and it will not be restricted to um, only Estonian genetic diverse seeds. It will be to genetic di diverse seeds and they will not, they will be out of scope also of the packaging law. Even if it's still a draft, why don't you send it to Mr. Flavis and... Uh, uh, yes, I haven't Flavis. seen this in written yet. Okay. Okay, so we have had these discussions and uh, several of the ministry workers are there and telling that they're working on it. I, I have actually, yes, a paper also on it, but uh, it was a memo made from the last meeting that was last week. Yeah, I'm not just joking. I mean, we, we remember Denmark was a good example for the Greek uh, government at some point. Um, we, we shared, and the French, and the French, exactly. So I think that if legislation exists, which is gives a good example, it should be shared now. You know, the point is, it's going to be done now. When in June the thing is out, then it goes into the whole legislation process and everything that could be considered by the, and we've heard the commission does want to consider things that are still coming up, do it now, it's the moment. Thank you very much. I come back uh, to, um, uh, to your region because I'm, I'm also into seed, organic seed production now and we need your varieties because in our region, in northern Germany, the geese, the wild geese, uh, stay until April. So we can only uh, seed out in May and we have to harvest in September, or early September. It's almost your uh, growing season. So maybe your varieties are interesting for us too, but we come back to that later. Ricardo. Ricardo Bocci is technical director in the Rete Semi Rurale. M many of, your, of you who are here will know him. Um, and that uh, um, includes farmers and researchers. Um, and uh, you play a very important role in the movement and the network of Let's Liberate Diversity. So when I said liberalization, of the seed marketing law. Can you do anything with that? Is that a tricky thing, liberalization? Uh, or what kind of liberalization you are thinking of with your network? Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Anders, for this tricky question. <laughs> uh, I think liberalization, it's a strange word for us because we are not for liberalization. So what we would like to have, there are policies. So we would like to have good policies, a good room for different kinds of farming, different kinds of seeds. We had some years ago during the previous negotiation, a discussion within movements and organization about this idea of free trade, liberalization of seeds. So we had also discussion about the European system is the right one or we have to follow the United States system because they have more, let's say, freedom to operate. But if you look to the United States, they have also big companies. If you are a mice breeder or a mice farmer, you have only GMOs. So you don't have a lot of freedom as a farmer to use the variety they will, you would like to use. So we don't think that free trade is a solution for Europe. 
but we think that we need adapted policy, that's for sure. And uh, I would like to say that we need to have uh, also innovation policies adapted to the different kind of uh, system, because before Annika uh, uh, told about uh, marginal areas in Finland, but we have the same problem in Italy. We have a lot of marginal areas that are mountains, hills, where we uh, gave up to develop varieties adapted to the system 50 years ago. In Italy, public universities after the Second World War, they develop adapted varieties for mountains, soft wheat varieties and so on. Now, anymore. So we forgot many areas in Europe. So our research, public research activities should be focused again on marginal areas instead of following, let's say, this false idea of progress and new GMOs and so on. So we have a large, a large let's say, possibilities for agricultural research and innovation that are not explored at all by public university. And that's the work that we are doing in Italy with some uh, public researcher. It's really difficult to find breeders now that are trained to do participatory and decentralized breeding activities because most of breeders, at least in Italy, they are molecular breeders, even in university. So they even don't know barley or wheat they can talk about DNA and sequencing information, but not about plants, crop, and so on. They get lost in the fields. And we need to have, again, these possibilities and people that are able to taste the grain to say, that's good. Something that we used to have in the past, no? And we lost this capacity. And, and that's a problem for us. We are partnering in an European project that is live seeding together with IFOAM, EU, and also uh, FIBOL. And we have a big seed companies that it's as a stakeholder. And they said in the last meeting that they spent more or less 250 million of euro on research innovation for new varieties in conventional agriculture. 250 million. How many money we spend in Europe for organic breeding? Almost nothing. And we cannot reach 25% of organic agriculture without research activities and breeding for diversity. So that's, for me, it's the key point that we have to address. So that should be part of the package in June, no? That's good, good money for good breeding. Yeah, enough room for new varieties. Yeah. That's the point, yeah. And not only old varieties. Yeah. 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 So you would also go um, with Eric in saying... Uh, let's move on with uh, the production that is adapted to the challenges we are facing. Um, I, I, I've talked to many breeders, always the same story in Europe. They are uh, uh, struggling for, uh, for decades, um, never got really support for it. And to get onto the market is, is an enormous challenge. So it's not just the public money, it's all the difficulties of getting these varieties onto the market and getting recognized and so on. We will get into details with some questions at the end, but I want to get uh, Frank Adams in. He's a farmer, uh, he's breeder, no, he's reproducer of seeds. You tell us what you are doing in Luxembourg and uh, what, what did you take from now, from what we've discussed and from what is announced for June? What do you take as, as, as a farmer who's not only preserving but producing diversity? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for everything that's been said. And of course, I agree, but it's not really my field of uh, expertise. Um, I'm concerned about the seed laws, but I'm not an expert. And I got involved in political work by the force of things, because uh, when I withdraw and uh, grow my seeds, it's almost like a, a world apart. And uh, well, very easily you see, it's not so easy to share seeds and also market seeds. And so I got involved in these uh, subjects, but on the basis as a, a market gardener who's been growing seeds now for 30 years, according to what I call the ecosystemic approach. This means that I'm not using any pesticides. I have not ever used any pesticides for the last 30 years to see how the plants react. And this is uh, um, like based on the uh, knowledge that plants have their own defense system and that they can uh, 
like uh, through epigenetic mechanisms and can also like through uh, secondary metabolites defend themselves. And it's really interesting because in the beginning it was very difficult for me with all the insects, easy, what was really interesting to study and also the diseases. But now I can see that uh, through the repeated cycles of reproduction on farm of seeds through the years, these plants have become strong and the quality of the seeds is quite good. We compare this to other seeds that we buy. It's not, I'm not going to make like publicity for my seeds, but it's just, I'm, I'm so happy. You should, you should. Yeah, of course. I'm so happy about the results. And now we're working with the Ministry of Agriculture. We're also marketing our seeds to professional market gardeners. And this, of course, for me, it's, it's like uh, hard work because there's so much paperwork. Uh, and, and of course, I'm waiting for a seed reform where like small actors like, like me, will uh, see some uh, facilitation of their work because in the first case, in the first place, I'm not uh, a seed producer, but I'm, I'm involved in uh, biodiversity, cultivated biodiversity. And also what is interesting for me is food quality. And I think the two are very much linked. And uh, I think there are possibilities for uh, seed production that uh, are not based on technological, um, how do you say, um, uh, techniques, <laughs> that's it, but uh, it's, it's um, the more, how do you say, um, traditional way of farming. And when uh, I get interviewed, everybody like claps me on the shoulder and says, that's very good what you're doing but this will not feed the planet. So I think what Ricardo just said is also very interesting because what's happening on the ecosystemic level, the ecosystemic interactions between the microorganisms, the plants, uh, the genetic information in the seeds and all these kind of things is not really addressed uh, when it comes to uh, agroecological systems. And this is what I would really like uh, just as Ricardo said, and also as the opening of the seed laws for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would still like you to tell us a little bit about uh, the um, network you are leading in a region. So you are, you are doing a bit the same thing as Ricardo is doing. Exactly, there it is. Part of that network of the Let's Liberate Diversity. Just a few words about that network, because I think it's okay. important that you share that. Too. Well, yes, in fact, there's two, two networks. So, yeah. We have yeah. one in Luxembourg, which is called Seed, uh, Seeds for the Enhancement and Evolution of Diversity. It also works in German and French. Um, and uh, this was, um, well, we founded it 10 years ago. This is our anniversary this year. And in 2015, we founded another network, which is called the Réseau Meurs Rhin Moselle. This is in French, RMRM. Uh, this was an initiative from Let's Liberate Diversity in 2050. So this uh, is regrouping uh, different initiatives in Luxembourg, uh, north, uh, north of France, Belgium, Wallonie, and uh, some regions in, in Germany. Yeah, and so what we are doing is we're bringing people together. This is, is not exactly like, uh, for example, in Archenoa, because we, we are very tiny, we are very small. We're trying to get actors together who work for the diversity of cereals, um, fruits, vegetables, and also other cultivated plants. So it's more like a platform for experts, and we're trying to, uh, how do you say, um, bring up momentum also for our political work, and we are really grateful to be members of the Let's Liberate Diversity European Network. Wonderful, it's a family. Everybody knows everybody. Annika, you wanted to make a, a comment, and then Eric? I, I am also in the network. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I wanted to continue, Frank's... Uh, um, yeah, I felt a little bit bad before because I said that these heritage cereals, they give half of the normal yield. That What can we do with them? But actually, we have been doing research on their mineral content. Of course, everybody knows that they give much more proteins than uh, modern sorts, but they actually give also much more minerals. So actually, even if we get a lower amount of yield, then the amount of nutrients is high. So um, this, this, in a way, it, it, I think it's very important. And uh, if we talk with old people, then 
100 years ago, we were eating one slice of bread and then we could keep running. Or even 50 years ago, uh, we're playing the whole, yeah, the whole morning side as a child with one bread. But nowadays, perhaps we have to eat half a bread or a whole bread in order to get this feeling of that we are, we don't need more food, no. And so I think research is very important also that we should connect to this. We need also research uh, for these diverse seeds, no. And um, yeah. That, that reminds me of the movement of the free bakers in Germany who say we want to use cereal populations because that is a mixture that gives us a high quality of products and the consumers understand it immediately. That's something for Zara, health and quality of food. Eric. Yes, thank you. This is exactly what I wanted to say. Because, I mean, more than 30 years ago, uh, if some... Um, bakers started getting interested in, in wheat, you know, it's because they thought that the, the bread they were making was of bad quality because the flour they were getting was not tasty enough, uh, was too high in gluten and all these things. So they got interested into how the wheat was made and that's how they got interested into the different varieties, the different populations, and many of them became farmer as well as bakers at the same time. So, uh, um, so I mean, there's a clear link here, but which is also linked to this issue of yield that Annika mentioned, you know, part of the problem is that it's everything about yield all the time, including in the, in the VCU uh, that Catherine uh, uh, mentioned. And so we have seeds which are high yielding, but to be high yielding, they need a lot of input. They need a lot of synthetic fertilizers and, and they need pesticides. If you test them into low input condition, they will probably not have the yield that they show as well. So, I mean, yield should not be the alpha and the omega and other traits and other aspects in breeding are very important. I mean, not of course disease resistance, but as a taste, organoleptic qualities uh, 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 as well. And they have a place. So, I mean, I fully agree with what you said, you know, uh, testing uh, um, VCU under organic conditions should, should, should be generalized uh, uh, as well. Uh, that's very clear. Um, and when we talk about sustainability, I mean, on the one end, it's a bit tricky because you cannot reduce sustainability to one trait or one variety. And it's the same with a discussion on, on NGTs. You know, it's the whole system, it's your whole farming system, which is sustainable. If you talk to an organic farmers and ask him or her about uh, his or her yield, he will probably reply, you know, well, what matters the most is the state of my soil. You know, if I have healthy soils, uh, we have high yield, whatever variety I, I, I use. Uh, as well. So it's a bit tricky to talk about sustainability of varieties, but on the other end, it's clear that it should not be all about yield. So if sustainability is understood in this way, you know, that we move away from a single focus on, on yield, uh, that would be a positive development, that's for sure. I would like to close this round uh, on, the, uh, on the panel. No, 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 it's not yet. There are two before, Katrin and uh, Ricardo, and then open it to, the, uh, to contributions and questions uh, from the audience. Because I think after this, where we mostly tell us our, our stories between us and saying, yeah, I agree and so on, there's the moment of now giving clear indications of what we like to see from the Commission, because we are talking about the new EU regulation on marketing of seeds. And so if there are any suggestions, any things that need to be taken into account, it's now to, to do that. But first of all, Katrin. Thank you. I wanted to bring this discussion on quality uh, back to the seed marketing reform. As, as has been mentioned currently, the, the two tests that determine whether variety can enter the market, it's the VCU, where the focus is on yield, and the DUS test, where the focus is on genetic uniformity and stability. And the criteria for that, as I mentioned, come from an intellectual property rights regime. One example, maybe to make it more tangible, on courgettes, I think if you want to uh, register a new courgette variety, there are over 70 criteria in relation to the courgette plant that have to be identical across all plants. So some are relevant for the trade, like the size of the cucumber, the shape. Some are completely irrelevant, like the color of the leaves, has no relevance for the commercial value of the courgette for the end user. Um, those criteria are developed to enable intellectual property rights to be granted on the variety. Um, but they are also being used to decide what can enter the market. It's, it's 
illogical, it's absurd. And these issues around health, taste, uh, yeah, quality, they're not reflected. It, 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 it just com seems completely absurd, yeah. So it needs a new one. Yeah, that's the one of, yeah, I think the main, with regard to the variety registration regime, a main call is to separate these two systems. The rules for access to the market shouldn't be determined by an intellectual property rights regime. Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah, uh, just some comments from points uh, said before uh, regarding yields. I think that we have to change the narrative because in our marginal areas, conventional varieties, they are producing the same. So it's not the uh, our varieties are producing less, but in marginal areas, maybe they produce more than conventional one. And extreme climatic yes. conditions. Yes. Second one, VCU. I would like to be provocative. Do we need VCU even in organic? Because uh, when um, we did the negotiation for the previous negotiation of the seed marketing regime, uh, in the report done by the um, uh, companies that did the preliminary report, they suggested to leave out VCU from the system because even in the vegetables that there is no VCU, they have seen a lot of progress with regard to the varieties in the market. So the answer at the end was, do we need VCU? So we have to, po to put the question on the table. Uh, last year in Italy, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture didn't pass a new varieties bred for organic agriculture because it was tested in conventional experimental trials. And so that's really a problem. And we don't have money in Italy to do to perform organic trials by public uh, research stations. So that's also part of the problem. And uh, uh, last point, I think that we have also an elephant in the room because I agree with you regarding intellectual property rights at the big companies. But our, let's say, uniformity, it's also because we have food system and supermarket chains that they need uniformity. So they are the main producer of uniformities in our food system. So we have to bring diversity even in the supermarket chain. If not, there will be no change because they are driven all the food chain, not the sick companies. And so we have to be aware of that. And last point to just finish for the commission. I didn't see any mention to the treaty, the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources as a legal basis of the new regulation. If you look at the international treaty that we as a member states of the, of the European Union, even Euro, European Union, we have signed, so we are part of the treaty. In Article 6, that is about sustainable use of agrobiodiversity, we have to do something. It's mandatory for all of us. And one of the art or the comma of the article, it's about changing and adapting seed legislation system to diversity. So that's for me could be the basis of the new. Uh, Very interesting, legally binding. So I, I Mr. Flevaris, you should have the chance to answer this. And then I get really to the audience and to my own questions at the end. Yes, please. I'll try to react quickly to yes. two points. One is VCU. The current legislation says very little on how to do VCU. Yeah. It's recognizing that it member states... something. No, no. It recognizes that member states can do it at the, according to their local needs, priorities and agroecological conditions. And uh, it's not true that it concentrates on yield. Yeah, no. Okay, it has many elements and it has a holistic approach. Whether it's appropriate for organic varieties or not, yes, we know that there is a problem with most member states not providing organic conditions for VCU. We know that. And that's why in the derogations, the latest derogations, we said that. Uh, VCU should be done under organic conditions and this is something, as we said already, we need to generalize these rules in the proposal. So we are aware of the issue. Um, why it's needed? I mean, many stakeholders and member states and other farmer organizations uh, have said that this is an independent system that gives some assurance about the variety they want it. Uh, we have to listen all sides. Uh, okay, I, I stay here. 
legally binding I have a treaty thank you for treaty. reminding me yes. yes of course but uh, uh, we do say that one of the objectives is the uh, conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources and this exists already in the legislation so whether we specifically need to name the treaty or not but the exact objective is uh, one of the leading uh, reasons for this revision Good, that's always a good argument, legally binding conditions, we signed it and so on, Then, uh, but the interpretation yeah. scope is enormous, uh, what it means, uh, but it's always good to, to remind. So very good. Now, the floor is open. I had a first, yes, uh, is there a micro in, in the back somewhere, or do we need to give the micro from here, otherwise we share? Okay, just a very quick, uh, there's a micro coming there, so just uh, quickly. Yes. Presenting yourself and your question. Arndt Spahn uh, from the European Agriculture Trade Unions. Um, my question to the Commission is, is your proposal helpful to create fair conditions on the seed market, on the, on the farms who are producing seeds? In the time where I'm working in trade unions in the 40 years, we lost 80% 80, 80 of the producers of the companies. And my question to you is your a proposal acceptable to destroy the oligarchs of the European uh, seed production, to destroy the monopoles? That's my first question, because we lost unbelievable much workplaces, and we speak on good workplaces. Second, uh, I can't think about a uh, splitted market in, in, the, in the rules on the level of the enterprises. As an example, we have 200,000 production uh, gardening uh, enterprises in Europe and uh, they can't work with the professional and uh, non-professional rules. So I understand fully Arkenoa, but for the markets and for the, for the production, it's not helpful to uh, create uh, 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 double standards. And last question. Uh, I heard that uh, uh, ecological seeds needs uh, an, an, an acceptance on uh, conventional areas. My question to the Commission, why we don't change it? Why we don't take conventional seeds uh, under, under ecological uh, conditions? That will be maybe helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, changing rules uh, and exceptions. So, Mr. Flivares, would you like, or Mrs. André, to respond to the questions, or? Yes, so. Um, it's another project, perhaps another proposal to, to the package. Uh, the legis we have to think uh, the framework. Uh, this proposal is about uh, production for marketing and access to the market. So what it will do, it will open up the possibilities for other material. So it cannot, whether it's going to break the monopolies or the oligopolies or not, it's, it remains to be seen, but it, it just gives access to the market to many more uh, different kinds of uh, breeders and uh, material. So it opens the road and then whoever can gain that market and get the share of the market, I think that's the only thing the legislation can do. The second question was the organic convention, yes. the testing. Um, as I said before, VCU has proved at least for uh, many stakeholders as a a useful tool. We have already explained that um, we need for enabling uh, the registration of organic varieties to uh, do the testing under organic conditions. I think its uh, segment must be um, given its own room and that's what we're trying to do with the organic varieties uh, to be tested under the respective conditions. Um, we are trying to um, elaborate a bit 
on what the VCU or variety examination should look like. And uh, one, of, one of the ideas is, yes, uh, the adjustment of the variety, the reaction to the variety to low input conditions, it's one of the things we're looking into. So I don't think we're going to straightforwardly say that all varieties must be um, uh, tested under organic or low input conditions. But uh, again, we see the need to put some general rules and member states to implement uh, according to their priorities and the agroecological agro conditions. We're not really looking to put fine details on how it should be done. And the third question, garden centers, yes. Garden centers and the amateur gardeners. Um, I know uh, previous um, proposals criticized a lot for not thinking of the amateur market. We tried a lot with the studies and the consultations to understand what is a amateur market and really um, our lesson was that um, any kind of material that is on the market, if the one puts it on the market, uh, feels that it has a demand by the amateurs, they will put it in a small packet and they will um, reach the, small, uh, the amateur gardener. So, the problem it's not that we are regulating or not regulating amateur uh, the material that reaches the amateur gardener uh, the problem was that for us that different um, material diverse material was restricted and that then it could not reach not only the amateur gardener but also the uh, professional uh, users so I think the approach should be we open up to all these different kind of material and then if a professional user uh, wants to use it, they can use it. If an amateur uh, user wants to use it, they can use it. I think we should the look market from the, decides. the market decides. What we want to do is to open up all the possibilities for all this diverse material to have market access. Now, if the one puts on the market wants to address organic, big farmers, small farmers, or amateur, or all of them, it's up to them. I think the only thing that can you can tell apart what is addressed to a small farm, uh, amateur garden or not, is the size of the packet. If you put hybrid seed in a packet of three grams, that is definitely for amateur. If you put the same variety in a five kilo, then it is for professional uh, operator. Okay, understood. Think, okay. All right. I perhaps before I give the floor to uh, Blanche Bagarinos Re, I had prepared a question concerning the privatization of the quality checks of cheese, of, of cheese, of seeds, uh, quality checks of seeds. And my question there is will the authorities then in the future lean back and say, well, that's now a private thing? And will the big companies just uh, give the protocols and that will be checked and the small producers have the big difficulty of having higher costs to follow those rules? I, I think you refer to what we call uh, the introduction of official supervision. Exactly. So that gives an opening, an option to the breeder to ask the authorities to carry out the necessary examinations and the authority to supervise and control uh, the results. It's uh, a system that comes to give uh, flexibility to, to solve. No, mainly no, 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 the biggest problem, and I think it's coming uh, very close to the need for checking under organic conditions. Because currently, what the member states, why the member states are not offering organic testing uh, while they could. A few member states, like Austria, they offer wheat uh, 
testing under organic conditions, I think, for 20, 30 years now. So they know about it and they do things. But when we discuss with them why they have not generalized this, they say we don't have the areas, we don't have the means. So, and we don't, because we need to convert the testing station to pass the conversion phase and then do it. If we allow them, uh, it's just an example, all kind of breeders can benefit, but specifically the organic who have the uh, uh, farm that has been through the conversion uh, and they do uh, the examination in their field under the supervision of the authority, they gain because they get exactly what they want, the testing under the organic conditions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Blanche? Yes, thank you. Um, Could you just present yourself qu quickly? Um, I'm a French lawyer specialized on environmental law and especially on uh, agricultural biodiversity. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, coming back to uh, varieties intended for non-professional users, uh, it is actually not as simple as you presented it because um, in the actual, based on the actual legislation and especially the definition of the um, of what is marketing, marketing in the actual legislation says that it, it is any transfer of seeds uh, intended to commercial exploitation. Based on that definition, many member states uh, have put have strong tolerance on what is intended uh, to non-professional gardeners, meaning they consider all these exchanges of seeds are out of the scope of the actual legislation. And some member states have even put in place legislation, express legislation, to exclude these exchanges of seeds uh, out of the scope of the legislation. It is the case of Denmark. It is the case in France. We have a law for that. And it is, I suppose, the case uh, in Estonia. And Finland also. And Finland also. So if you bring these transfer of seeds expressly into the scope of the legislation, you're, you're going to put an obstacle on the actual um, situation, legal situation in these member states. It's going to be a mess, in other words. So just think it over again, because based on the actual definition of what is marketing, many member states have already put these transfers of seeds out of the scope of the legislation. Point one. Um, point two on the VCU, I like the, um, I like the proposal coming from um, Ricardo um, to question again the VCU. I understand the Commission is not ready to question it, but I, I would say it is, it is true that right now um, the main focus in many member states is on yield. And it's, it's not only that the focus is on yield, it's also that VCU brings competition between the varieties that are candidates uh, to be registered in the catalogue. It's, it's called in France, it's called genetic progress. It's a mandatory genetic progress, meaning that a, a candidate variety uh, to be registered in the catalogue needs to be better in terms of VCU, that the varieties that are already in the catalogue. Why do we need that competition between varieties? In France, only 30% of candidates' varieties are registered in the catalogue. Why do we need that competition between varieties um, if all farmers don't have the same needs, if all territories are not the same? Um, in other words, if you're thinking about derogations uh, for sustainability based on sustainability criteria, uh, meaning test the VCU under sustainability conditions or low input conditions, uh, please also think about other kinds of derogations, not only sustainability or low input conditions, but also maybe marginal areas. Soil conditions or soil conditions or you know because needs the agricultural needs are plenty it's not not only about yields and 
maybe two or three or, th or four other criteria that are already encompassed in VCU. Um, the reality on the ground is much more diverse than that. So if you don't want to question VCU, maybe think, uh, think it over and, and try to integrate other derogations for VCU. Thank you. Thank you very much. Short comment by Ricardo. Yeah, I really thank uh, Blanche for this point because we have to question uh, agronomy, agricultural science. This idea of genetic progress is something that is uh, out fashion now. Eh? Science is much more complex. Of, so we have to uh, challenge the idea of the best variety as we used to have. The best variety is the adapted variety for a, a particular system. And so VCU will be too expensive to test specific variety for specific system. And member states, they don't have money to do it. So the best way is to get rid of. Thank you. OK, Mr. Flera, Flera, Flera. Um, Dorota previously tried to explain that uh, one of the things we are doing is um, we will lift uh, many of the current restrictions on the conservation varieties and also expand the scope of that system uh, to uh, newly bred locally adapted varieties. That is a very big opening. And if you remember what we write in the conservation varieties, there is no certification there already. There is no VCU. So not looking only back to conservation, but also to the results of participatory plant breeding of more diverse uh, varieties that cannot always meet the US and without VCU are in that uh, part of the system. Now for, yes, we're not looking into ditching a VCU because what we heard in the consultations from many other stakeholders they said, okay, we like the system, we are interested in maintaining and refining it or whatever, but um, that's it. That's another um, uh, production system. And we said, okay, that is good for your production system, but for all the marginal areas, for all um, low input conditions and uh, low input systems, the current derogations for conservation varieties are not enough. We're opening up no limitations in quantities, um, no geographical uh, restrictions, no VCU, and I think there are two worlds. They meet somewhere. Uh, the one, the, I mean, there are uh, exchanges, but uh, they're, understandably, there are different needs, and I think we are, uh, have thought about it, and we are thinking of those two different needs in what we are going to propose. Thank you. I think I have to come back to the package of June and to the point of how can, if at all, there will be so-called new NGOs in the game. I remember we had a map of all the organic farms around Europe spread all over the place with the regulation saying no GMOs. How will these guys be able to um, stay clean of those new NGOs, uh, NGOs, new uh, GMOs? Um, and how will the labeling be done? That's a question to the Commission, because it's not your uh, 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 responsibility at the moment, but just imagine these kind of very um, uh, clever techniques. I remember when we had the negotiations on the organic regulation, it was recommended to us, why wouldn't you accept these new kind of techniques like CRISPR-Cas in breeding for organic products? The question is, how is that going to be labeled? How is that, that uh, going to be a 
um, a, 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 a possibility of uh, identifying what is what. Is that foreseen? I, I can see you are smiling. Ms. André wants to answer. She wants to answer directly. I think if you have a straightforward answer, you get the microphone immediately. <laughs> oh, I think, um, yes, I understand your point, and it's all about information and labeling. So I think at this point in stage, and you better ask Irene Christian Sanchez uh, what she can say. Uh, it's one of the elements which our colleagues are considering. Uh, how to inform and make uh, indeed the organic farming aware of whatever category of new genomic technique use uh, is uh, would be authorized. So that's indeed a key question uh, which our colleagues are going to address and propose solution. But I'm really not going to give you any hint here how this will be done, but it is clearly a crucial element uh, which is being under discussion internally in the Commission. Uh, it is uh, a, a, an important point for agriculture yeah. and uh, they have to find a good solution on it. Uh, so that, that's one of the important elements and in the proposal and in the narrative to explain how they foresee it. So yes, it's certainly a key element. Thank you. Yes, there is two. Yes. Oh, it's just so Eric, take the microphone. No, oh, thank you. Just to you follow have the up. solution, apparently. Yes, yes, <laughs> very much. No, I mean, this issue of identification of ANGTs is very important because, as you know, the organic regulation bans the use of GMOs from organic production. So if a commission decides that uh, these NGTs are exempted from the current legal framework and are similar to conventional varieties. There will be no way to try to trace them in the production chain, and this would amount to imposing to organic producers to using them because they would have no means uh, uh, to ensure that they are not in the seeds they buy or for breeders to know what are in the seeds they buy. But it's not only for organic farmers. I mean, in Europe, we have a thriving uh, seed sector and we have a uh, representant in the room. It's a lot of SMEs uh, as well. And one of the reasons why we need to keep traceability for the, for the uh, NGTs is because of the issue of patents, precisely. You know, more and more um, genetic material is protected by patents and patents are mostly owned by the big uh, companies. And the only thing that protects us from um, legal cases of infringement uh, of uh, patent protection is this identification provided by the legislation uh, on GMOs. And this is what protects farmers and breeders from uh, what's happening in the US where farmers are threatened with lawsuits because they found some genetic material in their fields, which is protected by patents, even though the farmers have never you know, use this genetic material, but it arrived because the neighbors grew it, for example. And I think it's it's really a matter of uh, protecting the European model of breeding in this respect. So it's not only for organic farmers, but it's important to maintain this traceability and identification all along the production chain. It's not enough to say breeders should have access to information about the techniques which have been used because uh, organic production, you know, uh, 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 and organic processors need to have clear information about the material that he or, or she uses uh, as well. So these are very important points, I think, in the interest of the whole uh, European uh, uh, breeding and agriculture sector. And two last points about what we expect about the seed reform. I mean, clearly, uh, we are all aware here that we're facing a collapse of biodiversity. It's happening now, you know, less and less insects, uh, birds. Uh, um, and so on. And it's clear that the protection of biodiversity should be one of the guiding lights of the Commission for, for this uh, seed reform, because like it was noticed, some member states have a very good, uh, let's say, um, interpretation and, and they allow this diversity to, to, to be grown on the ground, but other member states uh, clearly have a much more restrictive interpretation. So it's important that the next uh, um, Commission's proposal is very clear on this, on this respect and allow as much as room as possible for, for everybody who cultivates biodiversity on the ground. And my last point is that Ricardo here 
is one of the active members of uh, IFOAM Organic Europe uh, seed expert group, which really shows that there is no clear cut separation between you know, amateurs, gardeners, and professional users who want to access diversity. Organic breeders at the moment, they rely on the uh, amateur varieties, correct? Uh, uh, to do their breeding work and, and to provide the seeds to, to organic farmers. So it's very important that farmers keep having access to this amateur variety or diversity material, however it's called, because they need it also as professionals. And I shut up. The differences between, you know, the amateurs and the organic, that's the past, Eric. That was during the regulation on organic farming that's all over no i'm i'm too positive here but i would like to come back to the package and with the all the competence in this room and you can feel it that people have been on to this issue for a long time they know what's at stake from a farmer to the networks to the people who are lawyers and so on there are just a few months to go where this new legislation proposed will be on the table in a package with other things. And there will be discussions about deals. If you accept this, you get this, right? So I think keep the eyes open and be very, very clear that any kind of proposal you can make now is something that still can be included. I'm confident that the commissioner is really seriously interested in having that because they made 10 years ago an attempt and it didn't work. Every 10 years is my experience, is the chance, an opportunity, uh, a window of opportunity to make things right. And I think it's this year and it should be made right this year. Uh, Martin is looking to the watch. I'm uh, uh, in, in the power of being the moderator <laughs> and I'm, I'm just closing now with a big thank to all of you, to the panel, the big thank to the Commission of having stayed all the time here. I will not close without mentioning what ARC 2020 is because that is my new life um, uh, in a network and a think tank that has included a project called Seeds for All which is, um, um, has at the beginning, together with Blanche, Blanche been a, a way of showing who's doing what. And now we are more into a phase of saying, this is the action we need now. And it includes farmers, it includes people who are breeders and, and telling their stories and so on. And we are in close contact with many of these networks so from time to time, have a look at our website, arc2020.eu, and over to Marty. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to Hannes um, for the moderation. Now I want to switch to German, who needs translation. We have translation there, and uh, yes, Thank you very much for a very interesting discussion and thank you for the commission that you listen to us. Um, it's helpful for the next discussion that we have in maybe in June. Ja, uh, um klar zu machen, um was es hier geht, wird jeder sagen, Saatgut ist wichtig. Haben wir dem eigentlich zu wenig Beachtung geschenkt oder zu viel Beachtung in den letzten Jahren? Nee, ich glaube, wir müssen wieder mehr Beachtung der Saatgutdiskussion schenken, weil da fallen viele, Pro da fangen viele Probleme an äh, in, der, in der Landwirtschaft. Wenn Sie sich jetzt in diesen Frühjahrszeiten mal so landwirtschaftliche Fachblätter anschauen, dann steht da immer, die und die Sorten äh, können Sie anbauen. Die haben einen hohen Ertrag. Und dann bieten wir die Lösung, weil die sind dann sehr anfällig, zum Beispiel für, ja, für Mehltau. Ja? Aber dann haben wir ja die Lösung, dann können Sie dieses Spritzmittel einsetzen. Und das ist dann sozusagen das, äh, am Ende das Ergebnis der Konzentration des Saatgutmarkts in, in den Händen von Chemiefirmen. Sie bieten diese Koppellösungen an. Es geht nicht mehr um gesunde, sondern um hochertragreiche Sorten. Und da eignen sich natürlich Chemiefirmen mit dem Koppelangebot ganz hervorragend zu, das äh, zu verkaufen. Und äh, ich erinnere mich noch gut an die letzte Diskussion. Damals war ich nämlich Schattenberichterstatter für die Grünen zu dem Thema und ein wichtiges Argument der Kommission war vor zehn Jahren Export. Die Europäer sollen den internationalen Märkten sozusagen auch ein Angebot machen. Und da ist klar, da brauchen wir diese Einförmigkeit, da muss das Angebot überall gleich sein 
und dann läuft das ganz klar auf die Sorten hinaus, die überall dieselben Eigenschaften haben. Und äh, was Ricardo gesagt hat, das fand ich halt spannend, auch die Unternehmen, äh, die großen Abnehmer wollen gleich, gleiches, äh, gleichen Geschmack, gleiche Farbe und deshalb werden auch die auf eine, auf eine Einheitlichkeit abzielen. Was Sarah am Anfang gesagt hat, sind Tomaten eigentlich immer rot, rund und schmecken gleich? Nein. Aber jeder, der draußen Tomaten kauft, denkt, so sind halt Tomaten und nicht gelb, viereckig und schmecken vielleicht gar nicht so sehr nach Tomaten. Äh, deshalb ist diese letzte Reform ausgerichtet gewesen auf die großen Anbieter, auf den großen Markt und der Aspekt sozusagen, dass wir ganz viele kleine Anbieter haben, dass Europa im Gegensatz zu den Amerikanern noch viele kleine Unternehmen hat, ist immer so ein Nebenaspekt gewesen. Und ich denke, da müssen wir, glaube ich, ernsthaft darüber nachdenken, ob wir in der nächsten Saatgutreform die kleinen Anbieter schützen, ihnen den Markt eröffnen oder ob wir wieder nur den großen sozusagen das Angebot zuschustern. Für mich waren zwei äh, Sachen wichtig in meiner politischen Arbeit. Ich habe den ersten Eiweißbericht geschrieben, Hannes, du erinnerst dich, in 2010. Da haben wir gesagt, Europa muss unabhängiger werden von den Märkten, von den Sojamärkten Südamerikas. Und dann sind wir hergekommen, ja, was kann Europa eigentlich bieten? Soja ist ja nicht immer eine Antwort. Haben wir eigentlich Ackerbohnen? Haben wir Erbsen? Und das Ergebnis unserer Untersuchung war, wir hatten in Deutschland eine halbe Stelle, die sich mit der Weiterentwicklung von Ackerbohnen beschäftigt hat. Aber 50 Experten, die weitergearbeitet haben an der Weiterentwicklung von Mais. Ja, was macht denn der Bauer, wenn er dann ein Saatgut haben will? Und es gibt nur eine einzige Sorte für Ackerboden, die vielleicht 50 Jahre alt ist. Sagt er, ist für mich kein, kein, kein nennenswertes Angebot. Also müssen wir auch da und äh, da ein Gewicht drauf legen, dass wir die Firmen, die vielleicht für einen künft, zukünftigen Markt arbeiten, unterstützen, die Sortenvielfalt zu erhalten und neue Sorten zu entwickeln, die vielleicht für uns mal wichtig sind. Eine andere Frage. Die Bio-Verordnung, da haben wir ja fast ein Jahr lang gekämpft, äh, nein, ein Jahr gekämpft um eine Regulierung, eine extra Regulierung für den Biomarkt äh, bei Saatgut. Äh, weil die Kommission hat sich da, du weißt es auch, <lacht> hat sich da sehr quergestellt und nein, keine eigene Regulierung, muss alles einförmig sein. Und ich glaube, wir haben es geschafft und vielleicht kann das äh, tatsächlich eine Brücke sein für eine zukünftige Regulierung, eine offene Regulierung im Bereich der Saatgut. Der, der ganz großen Reform. Ich wollte noch äh, zwei Punkte sagen, die mich äh, einigermaßen umtreiben, weil gestern haben ja 400.000 Menschen eine Petition, äh, haben eine Petition unter, äh, unterschrieben und die ist gestern überreicht worden an die Kommission. Und der erste, und Sie haben das eben auch gesagt, der erste Satz war, nein, wir reden hier nicht über Gentechnik, wir reden über neue Züchtungstechniken. Ich finde, es ist sehr gefährlich, wenn die Kommission einfach mal eine Umtitelung macht und sagt jetzt, neue Gentechnik ist keine Gentechnik mehr. Weil wir haben es klar definiert in der Ökoverordnung. Biobauern müssen wissen, was sie am Ende anbauen und wie sie nachvollziehen können, was der Nachbar anbaut. Deshalb kann ich die Kommission nur warnen davor, einfach so die Trickkiste zu greifen und zu sagen, wir labeln das einfach um und schon sind alle Probleme gelöst. Das kann keine Problemlösung sein. Mein Appell ist, äh, holt die Saat Sorten aus Spitzbergen, aus dem Bunker, bringt sie auf die Felder und entwickelt die weiter. Denn das, was die Kommission auch gesagt hat, in einer anderen Richtung, wenn wir neue Züchtungstechniken, also neue Gentechnik haben, dann erhöhen wir die Vielfalt. Ist kompletter Unsinn. Gentechnik, schauen wir in die USA, hat die Vielfalt verringert und nicht gesteigert. Deshalb, lasst uns an den Sorten, die wir haben, weiterarbeiten. Lasst uns dafür einen Markt schaffen. Lasst uns Markthemmnisse ausräumen. Und dann kommen wir, glaube ich, zu einem guten Ergebnis. Ich hoffe, die Kommission hat gelernt aus den Fehlern vor zehn Jahren und wird uns etwas Besseres präsentieren. Dass wir was überarbeiten müssen, ist, glaube ich, allen klar. Aber bitte schön, dann in die richtige Richtung. Ich danke nochmal allen ganz herzlich fürs Hiersein auch der Landesvertretung, der Ministerin, auch den Dolmetschern ganz herzlichen Dank. Ja, wir haben das heute mal als Start einer Diskussion gesehen. Ich hoffe, wir haben mit der Studie eine gute Grundlage geschaffen für eine Diskussion und wir werden uns weiterhin aktuell halten.
und werden weiterhin vor der Entscheidung der Kommission vielleicht versuchen, unsere Standpunkte einzubringen. Vielen Dank fürs Kommen und Ihnen allen einen schönen Abend. Und Hannes, danke für die Moderation.